title of this conference is, is Trump the New Nixon. And uh, I'm really honored to be sitting between these two people. It's, it's really a pleasure. Ellen, I've read both her books, Web of Debt and uh, Public Banking. And we've now had several back and forth emails, so it's been fun just to uh, hear what she's at because she's combining that now with cryptocurrency. Talking about how public banking and cryptocurrency can work together. So I'm really thrilled she's here. Thanks. And Flip, uh, I've been to, had the pleasure of seeing Flip at two different conferences speak, uh, one of the most dynamic speakers I've ever heard. Flip, where did you just fly in from? Kazakhstan. <laughs> <laughs> so he might have the award here for the longest travel to, to get here. So uh, real thrilled that he made the trip. Astana. Uh, and so, Flip, I would say, if anything, I, at this juncture in your life, I, 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 can I comfortably call you a futurist? Is that a, a fair term? I, I would love that. Okay. Yeah, I like that. So, I think what's nice having these two here that we can talk about, first of all, and I'll, I'll get to, is that they know about, they remember Nixon. I, I don't. I was, I was very <laughs> little when that happened. So they can speak about it in real terms, as I'm sure some of you out there can as well. Uh, I'm going to address it. I know a little bit about your political orientations. I've heard Flip say quite a bit about this, and I just heard Ellen say a few things. But if you guys could each speak, what did you think about this year when Trump was elected? Did it surprise you? What was your initial thoughts when you saw that? Ellen? Um, well, I, as the chairman of the Public Banking Institute, I'm supposed to be a socialist, but I actually secretly cheered when he got elected. Um, so I'm what's called a closet Trump supporter. Uh, so, because it was so cool that somebody came from the outside, and of course he's you know got personality issues. That I mean he might not have the perfect personality for the job, but how many billionaires do we know that are willing to scale the scale the citadel from the outside, and that actually managed to beat off the deep state on both sides? So that's what worries me is the deep state, of course. Um, I mean, I always, was always formerly a Democrat, and then I became a Green when I ran for California state, state treasurer as a Green. And, but, but I just thought it was so cool that somebody actually managed to um, overcome the, the usual barriers to getting in. And then, of course, I have lots of relatives all across the country who are, I mean, they're farmers and basically farmers and factory workers, sir. You know, that's where my roots are. So so they are avid Trump supporters. So, oh, no, I'm sorry. One side's avid Trump, the other side's Democrat. Anyway, so I, anyway, I thought it was cool. Well, he wore his Trump hat at the entire conference the last time, if I remember right. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> <laughs> I just loaded my gun. <laughs> <laughs> And what's your thought on Trump? I mean, I know I, I've heard you go off a little bit about it. Okay. I, I, I think any time you elect the village idiot, idiot to run your country, you're going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys. Yeah, I'll just make one, one so more. we have some different view, uh, viewpoints here. Okay, so I think that's great. I'm, I'm what you call a libertarian socialist, all right? Oh, that's good. I'm a, I'm a socialist Trump supporter. <laughs> So the first president I remember dating myself is Stevenson. And my dad said that the smart ones always lose. So. Well, well, give us some background. You know, us younger, and we've always heard, heard about Nixon. And, uh, you know, we have these just sound bites. We, we think of him. But I mean, it's amazing when, you know, looking back on Nixon, starting with uh, Kennedy and how young he was when he was first running for president. Uh, and then his, his career went through all through the 60s and on into the 70s. I mean, he really was prolific in the, well, during your, your you know, early lifetime. What kind of figure do you remember Nixon as? You could talk a little bit about Nixon. Um, well, because I actually paid attention to the major media then, which I don't anymore, um, I you know didn't have that favorable of an impression, but now look you know from what I read, apparently he did some really good things that weren't highly publicized. I mean they were controversial. So I would actually say yes, Trump is the new Nixon, but for 
good reasons, not bad reasons, but I, I can go through those if you want to. Please, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Nick, what, one thing Nixon did was, well, first of all, he tried to get out of the Vietnam War, which he didn't succeed in doing, but he was actually anti-war. Um, he went into China, which was, people caught, thought he was crazy to do that, and opened up China. Uh, he, he went with I don't remember who it was, but somebody who got you know appendicitis suddenly in China, and uh, and they had to do emergency surgery, and they did it with acupuncture needles, no anesthetic, and he was fine through the whole thing. He smiled through it and talked, and and it worked out really well. So Nixon, you know, got the well. So my first ten books were on alternative healthcare, so I thought that was really cool. So so Nixon, you know, in other words, saw some value in good relations with China, which at that time it was considered, you know, this horrible um, communist threat. And then because he was a little, he could see that Russia would then be concerned, he then made friends with Russia and um, did the SALT agreement, which was detente on uh, nuclear weapons. So he actually, for that reason, I think the deep state probably wanted to take him down. and. Uh, they wanted to, wanted to take Trump down for the same reasons. I mean, originally, he said he was for Medicare for all. Or, you know, you know, I mean, if you go back before he was actually elected, he was for Medicare for all. He um, was highly suspicious of nine, the the, um, the the official story on 9/11. I mean, I saw that he was on a video. He was interviewed the day of 9/11, and he said. Uh, I know those buildings. He said, I worked with the engineers that built those buildings. He said, they, w they wouldn't come, a plane couldn't take those buildings down. So he was immediately suspicious. So he's been, um, you know, suspicious of the deep state, whoever they are, uh, all along. And but then when he, f and then of course, the first thing he did that I thought was good was to get rid of, um, um, I just forgot the name of it. Uh, no, uh, not after the, I mean, yeah. <laughs> we haven't done really anything yet as far as got rid of anything. I mean, when you, you say. Oh, the, right, yeah. right. Oh, no, that. No. It never that, actually happened to be. Yeah, yeah, T, TPP. yeah TPP. Yeah, TPP. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. yeah. And so that was cool. But I think that immediately set off whoever the deep state is. And they went after him. And they've been going after him ever since. So he is captured. So he can't really do the things that he intended to do. Well, well Flip, I mean, you know, I, I, I always think of Nixon shutting down the, uh, the silver, the gold window, and I mean, really bringing on fiat money fully. I mean, how do you, oh, view, right. that... I mean, how do you view Nixon when you look back besides? Uh, Nixon, to me, was a very complex person, as most people are, and certainly people who end up in either a polarized way or in some other way, attracting enough support to become a leader of, uh, of a country like the United States. And that election process probably accentuates both ends, the good and the bad, the, the ugly and the pretty and, and everything else. Certainly, I would be there absolutely saluting the fact that he did a lot in terms of opening up China, uh, I think the SALT agreement was, in fact, a, a very positive step in our relationship with Russia at the time. I, I think that he was a very large proponent of universal basic income. That was one of his uh, uh, right. introduced ideas. He had a family issue of health and um, that uh, he, he, he was sensitized to, uh, so he had a heart. Uh, on the other hand, he had a paranoid personality. He had uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the features of an individual who uh, would probably do just about anything under certain circumstances. He, it was very hard for him to draw the line of where his paranoia ended and, and where he was really uh, rightfully uh, suspicious or rightfully uh, uh, an opponent to somebody else. Uh, I, I think net-net, he probably had a positive presidency and a positive contribution. Um, 
even though I don't think I've ever been a fan of his, uh, I, I certainly recognize the uh, the upside that that some of his policies and some of his um, actions have resulted in. When you look at Nixon compared to Trump, Nixon was like the anti-celebrity president. You know, it was always talked about how he, he, he did not have good appeal on television. He had, he was, he was just not a, he just never mastered the medium at all in communication. And you have Trump who's just, I mean, it was amazing watching this guy work through all the different Republican candidates, nicknaming him, uh, going to the, uh, into Hillary Clinton, all the different maneuvers he did. Can you guys talk about that, of just watching this? I mean, you want to talk about a contrast of those two in, in the media. Yeah, I, I have read um, that when Kennedy beat, beat Nixon, it was that one um, turning point was the debates where Kennedy was such a great speaker and just, you know, had the vision, and Nixon was just kind of nervous and uh, just not an appealing figure. So he didn't really manage to get his policies out there that well. Sweaty comes to mind. Sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think that uh, tools, whether it's television, which the Kennedys were good at and Nixon wasn't, was the media at the time that was at their disposal and he either used it well or not. I think that the activities around Trump's election, uh, to me anyway, show the significant impact that propaganda still has and can have. If you harness it either in a positive or very uh, negative way, it doesn't matter, it's still very powerful, very toxic, very, uh, uh, very much rem reminiscent of the kinds of activities that then propagated uh, the Nazis into power in Germany, for example. Propaganda has its place for a leader to uh, employ uh, with or without help, and I believe in this case there was help, uh, to smear a candidate as much as possible. Now you have to maybe, maybe hear this. I'm not a, I was not a fan of uh, Hillary Clinton. I was a Bernie supporter, so. Me too. Uh, from my from my standpoint, uh, I'm I'm not sitting here saying he poisoned the well for for Hillary, but the Republicans did have an unusually long period of time of 12 or more years in which to hone the propaganda to the point where most Republicans could by rote recite each of the evil deeds that Hillary Clinton did as if they were puppets in a in a play, uh, and that sort of demonstrated to me that propaganda was at work and, and very successfully. In terms of mastering the tools, I certainly have uh, no intention to, to, to not give Trump the credit for taking on uh, vulnerable, specific markets and then using media to accentuate the issues that were important to those individuals. Uh, and frankly, uh, if there was a surprise to me, is that I thought some of these battles were were fought and won in 1968. Uh, I believe that uh, you know the United States was a good country that had you know had gotten over most of the really ugly uh, divisions, and uh, this particular election to me showed how powerful working those divisions could be for either party. Uh, if you just pick that scab, pick that scab, pick that scab, you can accomplish a lot of political miracles. Because on paper, and I know that Trump is called a billionaire, that is yet to be determined. I, I have a feeling he's just a Hail Mary passer. Every once in a while he gets $30 billion in debt and he passes a Hail Mary and makes most of it back. So I don't buy this brilliant businessman story at all. Um, and I certainly so don't. So if he's not, though, he, that's even more impressive. <laughs> oh, no, it's, it's, it it's, it's impressive from the standpoint that one can do the things that he did and, and end up with a uh, electoral college victory. Not a popular victory, but an electoral college victory for whatever that's worth. 
my feeling is that um, it, because he was a real person, I mean, all the other politicians, you felt like they were canned, they had a canned message, and you've, we've, heard all that, we've heard that message before, and Trump came in and he was entertaining, like you didn't know what he was gonna say, um, and he was like a regular guy, so maybe he had some faults, but, but it, he, he brought some, it was refreshing to see that, that a regular person could come in and just talk off the top of his head and get as far as he did as a younger generation watching Trump, and, and you know, again, I'll make the analogy back to Nixon. We always hear the, you know, I am not a crook line. That's sort of one of those, those sound bites <laughs> of Nixon. So it's always a trust thing. And who was Nixon? And you know, what was it? Was he this big manipulator? I, I think the thing with Trump, looking at it, is it's hard for anyone, at least my age group, and I would say younger, to believe anything he says. Because one day he'll say one thing, as he's done on many issues, and right now we're seeing that, as was mentioned earlier, about Afghanistan. You know, I mean, he was, you know, let's get the troops out, let's do this. So what's his policy now? He's building up more troops. And he seems to be doing this on many levels where it's hard to know what he, what he actually wants. And but, I, I guess, in fact, I'll put it in the deep state. Does it seem now that he's giving in to some other pressures to so-called toe the line? I think it's completely captured, and he really can't. I mean, it's... I think they, when you get elected, they take you into a little room and they show you a video of the Kennedy assassination, and that's that's the end of it. You know, we know where your wife and kids are, how, and then and and they sort of closed them off from from. Well, you know, I like to watch Alex Jones, even though he drives me nuts. But you get a lot of information from from. The, it seems to me the information now is on the on the conserv this conservative talk shows. So anyway, I, I'm about to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't watch it all the time, but I wouldn't so, guess Ellen Brown be defending Alex Jones. I would never, <laughs> coming in here, I would have never thought that. Oh, he's obnoxious. I agree. <laughs> but the, but the, he, he's a, or the people he has on say that they've got him surrounded, and he doesn't get information from. That when he does get full information, he makes good decisions, but he's not getting the information. And you could, yeah. Or they're, or they're just saying you've got to do it this way or we break your legs. What? I, I've kind of summarized it. I, I think anyone who goes to France sees a parade with military equipment and wants to go home and play with his toys and put, put together a Fourth of July parade with nuclear weapons going down Fifth Avenue is a fucking lunatic. <laughs> and it don't take no deep state to make him that. He's just stupid. Okay, well, going back to Nixon and taking the dollar off the gold standard, I don't think he really had a choice on that. I mean, the, it was when... Um, now I've forgotten the French. Who is the French? Uh, anyway, the French demanded Mid all their. Mid sorry? Mitterrand. No. De Gaulle. De Gaulle. Yeah, De Gaulle. Sorry. Uh, so De Gaulle um, <clears throat> uh, wanted all their gold. Wanted all of the France's gold back because when under the uh, Bretton Woods Agreement in 1944, it, gold was supposedly we were supposedly on a gold standard, but the dollar was made interchangeable with gold. So we said, no problem, you know, we had all the gold at that time, and we said, no problem, anybody who wants gold can, will we'll give you the gold, but meanwhile, of course, trading in paper money or whatever, uh, digital money was a lot easier, so most people traded in, in dollars. But then after the Vietnam War, when it was obvious that, that we were go going into debt and that we maybe didn't have the gold anymore, um, countries started pulling their gold out and de Gaulle wanted all their gold which was I think it was a third of our of our gold supply or maybe that was then after that the UK said okay we want ours too and that would have bank you know that would have pretty much decimated our gold supply so when de, uh, Nixon said sorry we don't have that much so close the gold gold window but I don't think he intentionally meant to you know create Fiat money. He was just trying to save, <laughs> save, save an economy that was seriously in debt. I don't have a real argument <clears throat> with anything that uh, you just said about that. The only thing I would say is that if you really want a conspiracy, you can go to the next level and and simply 
uh, sort of remember the fact that after um, Kennedy got into office, there was a passage of the uh, silver certificate as a replacement uh, note that carried some metal for whatever those things are worth. <clears throat> I'm a great fan of Wizard of Oz. Uh, and all of the uh, <laughs> all of the wonderful and al allegories there, but uh, I, I think that the United States was ultimately destined not to have the reserves in physical metals, and you know you do what you got to do. It's kind of like quantitative easing. You got to do it. You got to do it, um, <clears throat> or at least if you think you got to do it. I'm not a great fan of uh, some of the steps taken. Uh, but I'm not quite sure that I've ever gotten angry over the gold, uh, gold standard one way or the other, or, or the metal standard. Um, I, I simply would like there to be some control over the supply of money, uh, fiat or otherwise, and that's why Bitcoin to me is as attractive uh, as it is in comparison. Plus, it's not as heavy, and I used to always think in terms of some of the other instruments like uh, or asset classes like silver, gold, or even diamonds. Thank God that human beings like shiny stuff. Well, that they don't have any value beyond that shiny shit anyway. Well, well, you brought up something here, and maybe you're not aware of Ellen's work, but you brought up the Wizard of Oz and you brought up silver certificates. Obviously, she wrote a book called Web of Debt, which she did her whole the whole structures on the, the right. Wizard of Oz, and then you uh, you talked a lot about silver certificates. It's a little off the the, the Trump Nixon uh, topic, mm -hmm. but but as we move into this Bitcoin potential economy, more uh, this, I mean, there does seem to be now this shift to where we're, a lot of people are looking for alternative ways doing currency. We now have the competition with bricks. We have some things that are changing how we do currency. You know, whatever the conspiracy was with Kennedy regarding, I mean, it was on for, what, eight months or something, and they, they went back to the old uh, system. Shortly after he got shot. Right, just happened. Uh, I mean, it, okay, so moving forward, is there potential for a new revolution with this, with this new currency? And how does then, when you think about that in currency, I mean, that's been sort of what's propped up our government for so long. What happens when that happens? What happens to guys like Trump? I mean, how relevant is he, this, this type of new economy? Well, I imagine he'll be relevant because things don't change that quickly. Um, I personally don't think Bitcoin will work as a national currency. I mean, you need a national currency, and the problem is it's too too slow. I mean, it's our, it already can take up to an hour for a transaction, and, and that's 0.2% of M2 at the moment. So if you multiply that up by 500, then um, it's, you're going to be standing in line for days to get your coffee. So it's really not good as a, as for a commercial trade. So you need a national currency, but I think you could put the national currency on something, not a, not a global um, distributed ledger because that's going to be too slow. But uh, you can do it on like uh, um, smaller, di smaller distributed ledgers. So it's basically the the competitor, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the competitors. Uh, Ripple is what the banks are using. But the problem with Ripple is it's uh, it uses a coin which is XRP, and the banks own it. So that's not what we want either. But this is what my whole PowerPoint is about. We could become our own bankers and actually be turning our own IOUs into money, which is the function of the bank. The ba bank, if you go to the grocer and try to write out an IOU, the, gro the grocer won't take it. But if you go to the bank, the bank will turn your promise to pay into money, your future promise to pay into money. And they do that because they, they, they find out who you are, you sign a contract, there are all these different reasons. They know how to get the money back. Well, in India, they've actually devised a system where they can do all that, and it's all crypt cryptography. You can do it on your cell phone and get a, like small business people that never could get a loan before, like shopkeepers, can get $500 in five minutes on their cell phone because all this data is encrypted in 
well, there's several, there are a number of levels that they've gone through to get there. So the final, um, I mean, I, of course, I'm totally in favor of a public banking system, and we, the people, should should own this this the cloud and the and the uh, the algorithms that and the smart contracts that are coded into this thing. But the the technology is there to be able to actually literally create your own money, spend your own money on your cell phone. And what it is, what all money is today, virtually all money, is IOUs. It's basically all money comes from banks, which 95% of the money supply comes from banks, which um, are just turn loans into money. And the Bank of England has confirmed that. The Bundesbank has confirmed that. And of course, I said it in Web of Debt. And many, many money reformers have said it for at least a century. But uh, it used to be conspiracy theory until the Bank of England finally came out and said, contrary to popular belief, banks do not lend their deposits. They actually create deposits when they make loans. And 97% of the money supply is created in this way. So banks are creating our money. And the, the problem is we don't want the banks as gatekeepers. They decide who gets it, on what terms. They can uh, favor their cronies. And we have to pay high interest rates, or they can keep us from getting it at all. But you could use that, sim because of this whole cryptographic revolution, you could do that yourself on a cell phone and be totally in control of your data and your you would be creating your own money, just like in a community currency. I think the ideal would be a national community currency where money is IOUs between people. But the problem with community currencies is they're too limited. That if you go outside the community, they're based on trust. And if you go outside the community, the, the people don't know the people in that community. So they don't, I mean, you can't get your utility bill paid or you can't pay taxes, et cetera, with the community currency. But now there are various systems like Bancor is the latest. They did a $146 million ICO in the spring. Um, Bancor alleges, I don't really understand how it works, but that you can um, convert any current, you could create your own currency, or you could convert any currency, a community currency or a, a national currency. You can determine its actual market value without a market maker, without an people involved, and so you get rid of manipulation, and you, so you can make a market with any sort of currency for which, or you can, you can trade any sort of currency for which there is any market at all, even if it's just really limited. So anyway, there are all these technological things that are happening. So what I would envision in the future is, a, I mean, Bitcoin and blockchain have definitely broken ground and showed in the way and are totally revolutionary and you know have just shown us that there's another way to do all this stuff. But I think ultimately it will be a national currency that we basically are in charge of ourselves. Well, so just asking, Flip here, I mean, so I mean, the thing about Trump is obviously, and Nixon, after Nixon resigned, the whole faith in the presidency and politicians obviously was badly eroded. The public didn't trust him anymore. Now we have a celebrity president. I mean, that's a, probably a good Nobody medicine. trusts. <laughs> no one trusts anything he really says. And we're talking about government and we're talking about currency and other things that can happen. It seems almost like, I think, to younger people or other people that politicians, it's almost their passe. And that's what Trump, I mean, I don't personally think about what Trump's doing that much. And I think a lot of people, I mean, we hear about it, but it's almost, it gets, it's ridiculous. And so I, I'm just wondering how relevant it is. And I guess, it, um, what would you say, flip on that? Or? Yeah, I, I, I have not seen physically the connection between Trump and his ideologies, if he has any, sort of uh, in a position where you could judge how its impact or how his impact would have on something like cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin itself. I'm not quite sure he's completely um, in a position where he's able to either understand or articulate or, or even suspect what he might do should the topic come up. So I, I, I don't know how to say that. But I do know that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies that may in parallel exist with 
uh, Bitcoin are certainly aimed at a global marketplace, not a national marketplace. Uh, and as a global instrument, they allow the person and should allow the person, in my opinion, who's in South Africa, who's an entrepreneur and has the handicap of trying to be a entrepreneur with the RAND as the, the currency that they are given with which to compete on the world marketplace. It's easy to see that armed with a Bitcoin, the playing field would be a bit leveled. And that leveling of the playing field is an important aspect of Bitcoin. And in my opinion, concentrating on Bitcoin that way, highlighting its ability to solve issues, solve conflict, uh, in, enable people to compete on a global marketplace, are all positive things that fiat currencies can't do, uh, no matter what you do to them. Uh, they are hampered to the boundary of the nation. And the problem is that the nation doesn't really control, in most cases, I think there may be one or two exceptions globally, but nations don't control their money supplies or their money. Central banks do. And central banks create money in the first place by simply absorbing bonds and debt, putting it on their balance sheet as assets, and then taking that asset, theoretical asset, and going to their charter banks like they, we do in the United States, and allowing them to lend money with a 3% or a 30% um, um, uh, 30% or, or uh, actual cash uh, reserve, and the rest of it is money that is created with every transaction, every debt transaction, every mortgage, every thing. And, and, and I, I really think the enemy, in some ways, and, and I don't have this sort of hatred feeling, but I, I, I think the enemy of liberty is the central bank more than any, any other institution. Um, and I think that when we compare Bitcoin to the dollar, we're actually, we're actually comparing the Bitcoin to the wrong end of the spectrum. The Bitcoin ought to be compared to the bottom quartile fiat currencies, which are, for all practical purposes, worthless. And replacing them with a Bitcoin basis is easy to uh, comprehend. I just returned spending a couple of weeks in Kenya working with the Patels and the Shahs who really run the company, country, the Kenyan economy. Uh, and they are taking M-Pesa, which is what you may have heard uh, about minutes of telephone units that are being used to transmit uh, purchases uh, and are intending fully to redo that whole strategy, which happened accidentally, into a Bitcoin-based strategy. Uh, I just came back from Kazakhstan, uh, and, and there is an economic zone outside of uh, uh, Astana that is being created just like in Dubai, for cryptocurrencies to exist with no taxation, no overhead, uh, and, and given the, the daylight that is, I think, necessary for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular to flourish. Now, I understand the limitations of the blockchain to a T. I, I understand the performance issues, the volume issues, all of the things that are troubling people today, but I also would like to remind folks, as I will in my presentation, that the guys that invented Kodak, the digital camera, thought it would never work because it was too slow. It had two, you know, 20 megabyte worth of uh, uh, um, screen capacity or CCD capacity and a lot of other limitations, including the fact that it cost 75 grand to make or something. But today, you know, these guys, Samsung or Apple figured out how to replace all the cameras on the planet without even trying because they were really just making a phone. Um, and that is what I think will happen with cryptocurrencies and the add-on sometimes referred to as shardings or other components that are going to be surrounding the blockchain and the Bitcoin blockchain to make performance 
what is necessary in order for currencies to succeed and purchases and commerce to succeed. Some argue that Bitcoin will be used for massive transactions only. It would be sad to me personally if that happened, but billion dollar real estate deals being done in, in, in Bitcoin today are feasible, uh, performance wise and otherwise. The elimination of the third parties is a great, great piece of the uh, equation. And, and I don't think that governments like China or the United States, and, but I think China's got a lot better head on its shoulder concerning these things uh, anyway. But I don't think the United States has thought through its strategy about cryptocurrencies only because they think the dollar is invincible. And if you think that, you are going to miss a step or two where you could have killed something that you wanted to kill or absorb something that you wanted to absorb, and it runs away from you and becomes too potent, and you can't handle it anymore. It's the difference between Napster and Tor. You know, you let Tor go for a while, you ain't stopping it unless you stop the entire Internet. Uh, and I think we're going to see that in a relatively short period of time because we're going to get exponential, not linear, improvements in performance. Um, I mean, some people, I think, in the Bitcoin space have even missed the impact that all these cryptocurrencies had had on AMD and NVIDIA. These companies are making boxes like crazy uh, and I think have intentions of continuing to make GPUs that are astonishingly more powerful than the ones that are being used today. Now, what this has to do with Nixon and, uh, and Trump, I have no clue, but... <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll bring it back to that. Okay, so is Trump the new Nixon? Uh, the trust issue with, with uh, Nixon and government in general obviously went down greatly after uh, you know after he resigned. Trump, I think people are you know we now all we hear about is we hear about Russia, we hear about scandals, we hear about people leaving the administration. It it all just seems to be kind of a sideshow for any real discussion. And I guess the question that maybe again is on a different generation, is how the thing you're talking about, that's what gets me excited personally about how this becomes a global and how it becomes a new mechanism for decision making. How does politicians like Trump, how do they stay relevant? They don't, government? they don't. And, and in fact, I think that politicians like that denigrate the position to the point where nationalistic boundaries are probably a jeopardy uh, city-states already are crossing the boundaries of national uh, fences. And I think that uh, most of us don't really give a shit what most politicians are saying or doing because we have the power to run our lives in parallel. Now, there's intrusion, and we'd like to get rid of that intrusion, and I think that could, that could be done. But frankly, I, I just think that, uh, as an example, Global warming, controversial in most circles. Uh, somebody somewhere is sure that there's a conspiracy going on. I think the guy's name is on one of these buildings. Um, <laughs> but, but the bottom line is the following. If you really study the science behind this climate change, you've come to the conclusion that it's most likely that we're doing something to impact it. What I find silly is that there is an argument over this when the actions you would take, whether you believe it is true or not, are the same. What the fuck are people arguing about when you wouldn't do anything different anyway? And the answer is solar is beating the shit out of coal and oil already. You're gonna use that for economic reasons anyway. So who gives a shit if, it, if we're causing climate or not? We're going to go down that path anyway. So um, those are the things that make, I think, politicians irrelevant. And, and I hope completely irrelevant. Uh, because I, I think the people of this earth are smarter than the politicians that we normally get stuck with. And I think there's always been an adage. Sometimes it, it grows in velocity and, and volume. Sometimes it diminishes. But, you know, the reason we want 
some Democrats in the, controlling the House and Republicans controlling the Senate and, and have a split decision on the uh, Supreme Court and whatever, because if we can tie them up in needless bickering and they can't get anything done, the rest of the world can go on and, and do good. Uh, and, and so there's nothing wrong with them being in a stalemate. It's when they actually do something that they really hurt you. So, I would object to that. Okay, so, so <laughs> Ellen, kind of we, see, are you? <laughs> we, see, we see a Trump with a, a coal mining uh, hat on going around and that, you know, I mean, there is a part where you just kind of, it seems like it's such a role of what his, you know, what his, his economic vision. What do you see as a politician's role in the economy and, and moving forward? Well, uh, if you look at China, somebody said, oh, Catherine Estefet said, that uh, American politicians are all lawyers, are mostly lawyers. So they argue about things. So, they, so we've been arguing about infrastructure for at least a decade. And you know, our infrastructure is falling apart. So they never get anything done. The Chinese, as she points out, are all engineers. And so they get in there and they say, well, let's do something. And then they do it and they fund, they own their own, they own their banks. It, good socialists that you are, <laughs> you must appreciate that. So they own like most of their banks. So they do what all banks do, which is create credit on their books, extend the money, build the stuff, like their high-speed rail that they built, 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in 10 years, I think. And um, the high-speed infrastructure is the best for paying back. You know, it's, they're called self-funding loans. In other words, they generate the money to pay back the loan, and there you've got some infrastructure. So I think we do want to get rid of all this bickering among politicians and get some light on the subject and, and go for it. On the, I would say on the uh, uh, climate change issues, one advantage of the whole cryptocurrency phenomenon is if we can really nail down who's got the money, where it came from, and where it's going, we could get, it's the deep, well, what worries me is chemtrails and harp, and I think we are creating all this climate change, but we're doing it's like it's a military weapon. Um, so, when Catherine Austin Fitz will tell you all about that. <laughs> so, so they're getting all the money, and it's money is just disappearing, and we don't know where it's going. Now, if we really had a very secure, cryptographically coded whatever whatever language you use, in other words, if we could really trace where our dollars went, we could, we could get, get control back from that and throw a few people in jail while we're at it and actually have a true a community that actually, or a government that actually works for the people and does you know, what the people need. Well, the unfortunate uh, example of China, and I and I am very proud of the Chinese for some of the things that they're doing in terms of addressing pollution and outlawing uh, fossil cars uh, by 2050 or whatever they're going to end up doing. There's a lot of things they're doing. Unfortunately, it comes with a price of more government, and, and, and I mean, we might as well just make one party and give them all control, and then you end up with a China. Uh, I think we like, as Americans anyway, I think we prefer the chaos of India than the bureaucracies of China. And the, the loss of liberty is an enormous price to pay to get that uh, infrastructure done. Uh, frankly, infrastructure is not the problem. I, I think the problem is, and, and this is where I get shot, okay, so I get it. But the problem is that we're, we're, we're running this system in an expectation that the last two or three hundred years can be repeated in the next two or three hundred years. The truth is we can't. Things have changed and they've changed dramatically and they're going to continue to change exponentially. And the rule book, I mean, I'll give you one example that I use in my presentation. The idea of having a corporation with an objective of making money is suicidal. The only viable corporations are the ones that can afford to never make money. You look at Tesla, you look at Amazon, 
They sometimes accidentally make money, but it's not by intent. They are just trying to dominate, and they do what is necessary to dominate. I, that's a foreign thought. I get it. I understand it. But if you look through the successful value creation enterprises, they happen to have that characteristic, which I think is putting them on the precipice of distributed organizations that are ultimately going to be run entirely by software. And the rest of humanity is going to participate in it by being open source programmers to some degree to that software autonomous organization. Uh, so we're just in that step in which profit, which yields unusually uh, large, uh, uh, I would say, uh, gaps between the 0.1% and the rest of the folks on the planet. And I'm not opposed to giving those folks a shot to being the 0.1%. I've never had an evil thought about it, but I can tell you neither did Marianne, uh, Marie Antoinette. Uh, there is a revolution pending, and it will happen. And I don't care if benevolence is bestowed upon that situation and income inequality is addressed. Uh, for the benefits of it, for the purity of it, for the goodness of it, or it's to save your ass from getting shot in the next revolution. Either way is okay with me, but you got to solve the problem. So to kind of just wrap it up a little bit with this, I mean, do you guys see, do you see Trump surviving? Do you see he's going to get through his presidency? I think he will. Yeah. you see another term? Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Probably not. I mean, can we, do we really, and I'll, I'll, we'll open this up a little bit. I think this is a good question. Do we see another campaign like we just went through? Do we think that's going to happen again? Are we going to have this, this, this what our country's going to continue to do? Well, I think what he did was he escaped the deep state, which normally, normally elects presidents, and they did break him at the knees. And so, unfortunately, he won't get all those things done that that were that people put their faith in him for. So maybe that'll never happen again. I don't know. But I thought it was a really interesting phenomenon that it happened once. I, I, I don't know. And I don't think I'm skilled enough at taking the current set of facts and predicting uh, whether or not uh, Trump will survive this four-year period or the get reelected. I can tell you that our morning speaker just put an opinion piece out on CNN this morning in which he doubts that Trump has got a shot. Uh, and it's, or on, uh, i sorry, on Fox News, he put the opinion out uh, on. And uh, I, I would leave it to him to better predict than for me to better, to, to understand is what I am petrified of, petrified of, is having Pence as our president. No, that's true. That's the reason. He'll make, Evil and current. That's why he'll make it through his term. <laughs> so I'd rather have Trump if I had to. <laughs> and I hope Pence jumps in front of him if there's a bullet that comes out. <laughs> I'm kidding. In a Trumpian kind of way. <laughs> um. Okay, I'll, we've got a few more minutes here. I'll put it out to the audience. Any questions or any thoughts on some of the things we've talked about? Yeah, I have uh, about uh, you having a national cryptocurrency uh, you know, run by the government, not by the Federal Reserve, I assume. Uh, even though the Fed is coming up with a, with a Fed coin or something like this. But anyway, uh, how would that work with uh, the guy in Kenya that's got Bitcoin? He wants to do a deal with the United States. I mean, I don't know how you keep it centralized, the United States, the U.S. claim. Well, it, it, I think they can work separately. They don't need to, they don't need each other. Um, but I, my guess is that central banks will start issuing central bank digital currency. It's much more efficient, and they're all looking into it, and they all know how much more efficient it is. And they, they already have a digital currency, but the only players that get to use it are the banks. So it's their reserve currency. But what they could do, 
and should do, in my opinion, is open that up to the public. We could all have accounts with the central bank. They are a deep pocket. We don't have to worry about bank runs. We don't have to worry about deposit insurance. I mean, all the things that went wrong in 2008 won't go wrong again. We don't need to, the big players with more than $250,000 don't have to be putting their money in the repo market to get some return and some safety and so forth. So it would make for a much more efficient system. But it doesn't have anything to do with Bitcoin. Bitcoin can be going on doing their thing as they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that more concerning, if that path is adopted by national uh, reserve banks and they all issue their own cryptocurrency, I think they will do that with the intent of demonetizing the country. Which means if you got $20 bills and $100 bills, expect them to be worthless in the next five minutes. Sort of I disagree. like the Indians found out. Yeah, I saw a, pr a presentation by a, somebody from the ECB who was talking about a, a central bank digital currency, and he said there's no need to get rid of um, cash. I mean, the reason they did it in India was virtually the entire economy was a cash economy, and they're trying to bring people into the system. 95% sure. of our economy is already digital. You need your 5% cash for when the computers go down. To buy your drugs. Well, whatever. And I think that's what Drugs are illegal. Uh, <laughs> getting and, more and I illegal. think there's already been a hint that the $100 bill may be in jeopardy. There's been other countries, Sweden and others, that are contemplating or implementing demonetization policies in which cash will be uh, taken off the table. And, and I realize that it's almost sacrilegious to worry about it in the context of Bitcoin, but it is another attempt at control. Uh, and uh, the next step in the control is to open up the ledger and to make sure that the ledger reflects the actual identities of the individuals transacting business. And, and that's the purest form of losing all independence and liberty in the, in the context of your assets and, and money. So uh, I'm, I'm cautious about being uh, too optimistic that some of those things are all being done for our better good. The two things Trump and Nixon both did was intensify a drug war. And that's what Trump is talking about. His, his uh, um, You mean uh, uh, Sessions? Jeff Sessions. <laughs> Well, but uh, the states are all going for legalizing marijuana. I mean, that I think we have a states versus federal battle going. Which well, I'm a lawyer. We should be somebody should be going to court over over the um, interstate commerce well, clause. That well, the feds say marijuana is illegal. The states are saying that it's legal. Yeah. Correct. Right. Whoever's in charge of that, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, but right now I the feds. I understand it's a deep, dark state. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask you a question about the, you know, Trump versus Nixon? Um, one of the things that Nixon did was uh, he basically signed in the EPA. Yeah. Did you see Trump basically going against what Nixon did? Because the EPA has grown into something which it was never intended to be, which was to go all the way back into some farmer's land and say, you can't do something with your land because the EPA says this is what has to be done. We basically take control of all of the water. Now, is Trump going to reverse what Nixon created? Now, Nixon, I don't think, created or intended to create that, but what happened was the government ran away with it. I think that all government tends to do that. Once you put it into place, and I think I heard it here mm -hmm. again today. Right. Uh, that you establish and create something like the EPA with good intentions and the entity over time absorbs most of the attention and the purpose for which it was formed it diminishes. Um, I, I just know that, you know, I, I'm not a believer that uh, capitalism is always attentive to true uh, environmental issues. Uh, I think that uh, in some ways, things like Flint, Michigan are a demonstration of that. Uh, and, and a robust EPA doing the job well would be preferred over no EPA. 
Uh, but I think there are boundaries that have been crossed by the EPA and made rules complicated to the point where they're assailing. Do you see that too in other detrimental things where people think they're doing positive? Like you mentioned solar. Um, the solar arrays that are being developed and produced could end up uh, delivering you the next level of canal. Uh, I, I see solar well, changing I, I, so dramatically no, no. over well, our ships. What I'm saying is the production of a solar array is a very dirty process. The byproducts which are produced by those solar arrays, a lot of people don't understand what those are or where they go. So how do you do a total, everyone says coal's bad, you know, petroleum's bad, but no one looks at what the byproducts are of the solar array. That, that, that is correct. The, the thing that I'm aware of is that solar is going through transitions in which materials like graphene and others are replacing many of those toxic temp chemicals that were in the, in the production process. Um, what I'd like to maybe emphasize even more so is that if we fall asleep on solar, there's entire countries with billions of people of population from India to China that will be more than happy to take 100% of the solar business from us in the next decade. And I'm not saying to stop, I'm just saying that we need to develop a new... We, we ought to be... Well, well, maybe the EPA ought to be worried about that a little bit. Uh, so there, there, there are issues like that that I think in any new technology need to be, need to be uh, certainly addressed, and lithium batteries are yet another. Uh, lithium batteries for the short term are going to be the kinds of batteries that power electric vehicles, and probably there's a lot of other considerations that need to be put into place, like they will be in everybody's house. Uh, solar roofs are a preferred uh, approach to generating electricity because you no longer have the vulnerability of a centralized utility. And, and, it, and it yields a business on a distributed basis uh, that becomes an autonomous uh, Bitcoin-driven, cryptocurrency-driven business. Those are phenomenal pluses that if, so, if a few solutions get put into place along the way, uh, we got our cake and eat it too. Okay. We'll wrap it up here. Again, thanks a lot for coming to the two of you. It's been really nice to have you here and talk about this. So that's uh yeah, thank you very much.